Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Facebook live is uh, ready, Ustaz. And also Zoom is already uh, starting the recording. So back to the microphone if you want to start now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Everyone is doing well, inshallah. Waalaikum assalam. Iyakumullah, halam wa sahlam. But let us start today's class, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen. Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I uh, give you again all. May Allah make such sessions blessed and beneficial for us all, inshallah ta'ala, the speaker and the listeners. Uh, let me just share the screen with you guys. Uh, Abu Abdurrahman, if you can give me uh, access to the, uh, or give me a co-host so I can share the screen, please. Done, Ustaz, done. Exactly. Okay. Can you guys see, see the screen? Okay. So Alhamdulillah Ta'ala, we have uh, uh, completed the uh, first unit of our book, Aqeedati, My Belief, which comprises the pillars of Iman, the pillars of Iman. How many are the pillars of Iman, guys? Six. Six, good, Ahsantum. Okay, let's list them for me quickly. Believe in Allah, believe in the angels, believe in the books, believe in the messengers, believe in the hereafter, and believe in the predestination. Ahsanta, Ya Abdurrahman. Ahsanta, MashaAllah, Mubarak. Excellent, Ya Abdurrahman. I need one more, one more person to reiterate the pillars of Iman. Abdullah Baula, please. Believe in Allah, believe in the angels, believe in the books, believe in the messengers, believe in the hereafter, and believe in the predestination. Well done, guys. So, guys, please, I want you to always refer to the material mentioned in the book. I made concise uh, information pertaining the pillars of iman so it's all almost in every, every pillar it is in very you know short two pages you will find the important issues that you need to maintain as a muslim and learn as a muslim uh starting from to believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what exactly it means what exactly uh, presupposes from us as muslims so please go over the uh, material uh and keep a copy of it if you can make a if you don't have a hard copy uh you can send me an email, I'll send you a copy without a background, where you can make a hard copy of it. Uh, it, will take, it will take less ink from your side to print, inshallah. And you can, you can keep it at home, next to your bed, keep it as a reference, always uh, to review and understand these six pillars of Iman, inshallah. But today, let us go over a new unit, which is the pillars of Islam, the pillars of Islam. Uh, we have the pillars of Iman and we have the pillars of Islam. Before getting into the topic, who knows the five pillars of Islam? Who can list them for me? Uh, Hamza, please go ahead. Um, the pillars of Islam are first is Shahada, and the second is Salah, the third is, um, the third is, so, the first so is Shahada, the second no, is... No, already said it. The Shahada already said it, it's the first, right? Yeah. yeah the something which is, is mentioned salah. in the Quran always. As salah is mentioned in the Quran also with something else, always in many cases. What is it? Salah. Uh, zakah. Ahsan, Ahsan, Hamza. This is the third pillar. Uh, zakah. Then Sawm. Good. Yeah. Then Hajj. Yeah, Salam alaikum. Hamza. Ahsan Tay Hamza. Excellent. MashaAllah. Mubarak. Ahsan, I saw a hand from you before. 
Oh yeah, I just wanted to say the same thing. But also, I think some people they switch the Som and Zakah, right? Yes. Uh, why don't you say it again for us, Hassan? Uh, Shahada, Salah, Som, Zakah, and Hajj. Okay. The, the, the order mentioned in the hadith is the zakah before a psalm, actually. So in the hadith, it is the, the zakat mentioned before a psalm. Even if you look into the book of fiqh, jurisprudence, where they have the rulings in details of every uh, one of these uh, uh, pillars of Islam, uh, excluding the shahada, you'll see first they have the salah, then the zakah, and then the psalm, and finally the hajj. In the also, because uh, I, I, like I also from my uh, Islamic teacher, because like for when we look at uh, the book of Imam Muslim, he has like repeated the uh, sunnahs where it's interchangeable. Like some say it was uh, Psalm first before zakah. Actually, not not with zakah. It's actually that's with Hajj. With Hajj. Uh, oh, with Hajj. Yes. And, and okay. Some, yeah, and some of the fiqh books. They put the Hajj before the Psalm. Okay. 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 This is, yeah, and this is the narration of Muslim or Bukhari, where we have, one of them have, in fact, Bukhari mentioned Al Hajj before the Psalm, based on the Hadith that we're going to mention right now, inshallah. The Hadith of Ibn Umar in Bukhari, Muslim, where he mentions the pillars of Islam, and he mentions the Hajj before the Psalm, while the famous Hadith of Jibril that we have taken, where he mentions the pillars of Iman, the pillars of Islam, and Ihsan. Over there, the Hajj is mentioned at the end, after the Psalm. Okay. Ahsante, Ahsan, Barakallahu. Taib, let us see what are the pillars of Islam. It's as, as listed here before, before you guys. The two testimonies, a shahadatan, establishing prayer, uh, paying obligatory charity, which is a zakat, fasting Ramadan, a Psalm, and finally, pilgrimage, al-hajj, to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Mecca. So those are the five pillars of, of Islam. And let us get into details about each one of them. But before we, we delve into there, again, what is the proof for the pillars of Islam? Uh, we all know, have, as, as, as we have taken uh, previously, the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, when he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, from Akhbirni Anil Iman, tell me about Iman. And he, peace be upon him, listed for him the six pillars of Iman, right? And then he said, Akhbirni Anil Islam. And he, peace be upon him, listed for him the five pillars of Iman. This is the very famous hadith of Jibreel in Sahih Muslim. And we have another narration for Ibn Umar. Let me just maximize the screen for you. Let's zoom out in. Can you read the content here, guys? So we have the, uh, another hadith from the Sunnah is the uh, very famous hadith for Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Buni al -islamu ala khams. Islam is founded upon five things. And he went on and he said, sallallahu shahadatu an la ilaha illallah, to testify that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, وأن محمد رسول الله and that Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah عز وجل and he said وإقام الصلاة to perform صلاة وإيتاء الزكاة to perform to give the zakah the obligatory charity making the pilgrimage to to the house of Allah in Mecca and fasting in Ramadan here in this narration uh, like in, in Bukhari it mentions, like I said, Ihsan, pilgrimage before a psalm. Pilgrimage before a psalm. Where the narration of the hadith of Jibreel, the hadith of Omar, he mentions a psalm, then al hajj. And it's all fine as long as all five are mentioned in one place. So we need to, to distinguish between uh, Iman and Islam. We need to understand what is difference, the difference between Iman. And Islam. If you notice the six pillars of Iman, they are issues of the unseen, right? Uh, about Allah, about the angels, the books, the messengers, the hereafter, Al Qadr, 
all those matters are of the unseen. While in the pillars of Islam are tangible practiced issues like shahada, you utter the shahada, right? As salah, you perform the salah. As zakah, you give money or wealth that you have or uh, crops or whatever the zakah item it is. Uh, or also performing siyam, it is a practiced thing, right? Hajj, it is a practiced thing. So the iman, it is related to the issues which are uh, inwardly, meaning unseen, untangible, while the Islam deals with matters which are outwardly, are tangible, and can be seen and performed and observed. So this is the, pillar, the difference between the, the, the pillars of Iman and the pillars of Islam. As we know, in order to get into Islam and perform the first pillar of Islam, which is Ash-Shahada, the testimony of faith, you must accept and believe in the six pillars of Iman. So the six pillars of Iman are prerequisites for you to become a Muslim. So if someone says Ash-Shahada, Ash-Shahadu an la ilaha illallah, wa Ash-Shahadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, and he does not believe in any of the six pillars of Iman, he is not considered a Muslim, even if he says Ash-Shahada day and night. So the six pillars of Iman are prerequisite for a person to become a Muslim. Then he may utter the first pillar of Islam, which is Ash-Shahada. Are we clear so far, guys? Silent, meaning you agree? Yep. Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent. Yes. And a notice in the famous hadith of Jibreel, he, uh, alayhi salam, asks the Prophet, peace be upon him, about al-Islam, al-Iman, and al-Ihsan, right? So, so far we understood what is Iman, which is the six pillars of Iman, and we understood what is Islam, which is the, six, the five pillars of Islam, right? How about Ihsan? What is Ihsan? Ihsan, in brief, is to perfect the six pillars of Iman and the five pillars of Islam. To perfect all, the, all these is Ihsan. So to be perfect in your Iman, in the six pillars of Iman, to be perfect in the five pillars of Islam, you do the Shahada, you do, you do your best in Salah, you do your best in Psalm, in Zakah, in Hajj, and all that, to perfect that, this is reaching a level of Ihsan, which is the highest level in your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to perfect these matters, the pillars of Iman and the pillars of, of Islam. So again, what is Ihsan, guys? Show me a hand. What is Ihsan? Uh, Ihsan, yes. Ihsan will answer the question. Uh, it's basically like perfecting your iman and your actions. Ihsan, Ihsan, Ihsan. Uh, Usama, you have an answer to add. Go ahead. You can repeat the same thing, no problem. Ihsan is to believe in Allah as if you can see him. And if you don't see him, then you should know that he is seeing you. Assalamu alaikum, Usama. This is the definition said by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the same hadith, the hadith of Jibreel, right? When Jibreel uh, asked him, Akhbirni an ihsan. Tell me about what, is, what ihsan is all about. So the answer of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sums up to the statement that I have mentioned to you, to perfect your iman and to perfect your uh, pillars of Islam. And he said, peace be upon Sir, him. Uh, Go ahead. So where is it written so that I can write it? Yes, Ihsan means to perfect the pillars of Iman, to perfect the pillars of Iman, and to perfect the pillars of Islam. To do them in a perfect manner, to the best that you can. This is reaching the level of Ihsan, which is the highest level of the deen. Our, our deen, our deen is based upon Islam, Iman and Ihsan, these three matters, okay? Our deen is based upon these three levels, Islam, 
Iman, Ihsan. The last one is the higher level of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in our deen. Okay? So Islam is, is the, the, the foundation. Iman is a higher level, which is to perfect, to do the six pillars of faith to the best that you can. Okay? And Ihsan to perfect all the previous two levels, which is the highest level in our deen, the highest level of our deen. So again, we must accept and believe in both the pillars of Iman and the pillars of Islam. So like I stated here, the pillars of Iman comprise the inwardly deeds, actions and statements of the heart. What goes in your heart, this is the pillars of, of Iman. You believe in Allah, the angels, the books, messengers, the hereafter, predestination. These matters are of the unseen, right? So they are deemed to be or classified as inward actions, usually in the heart, okay? While the pillars of Islam comprise the outwardly deeds, actions of the limbs and statements of the tongue. So whatever you do with your hands, with your limbs, like performing salah and so on, whatever you do with your uh, tongue, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting the Quran, uh, saying good and kind statements to others, giving uh, greetings to others, salam and all that, this is done with the tongue. So it is also an act, action done by the tongue, also considered as an act of worship. So a Muslim must accept and believe in both meaning the pillars of Iman and the pillars of Islam. If he, she, if he or she refuses, they are not considered Muslims. If they refuse to accept or believe in the pillars of Iman or pillar, pillars of Islam or any of them, the one is not considered a Muslim in this case. So look to the last statement here. To perfect both pillars of Islam and Iman is the highest level of the deen religion, which is called Ihsan. So this is the statement you're looking for, yeah, Siraj. To perfect both pillars of Islam and Iman is the highest level of the deen, which is called Ihsan in this case. I made uh, like a footnote here. So when we say about, when we talk about the actions of the heart, actions of the heart. Again, like I said, the pillars of Iman they are inwardly, right? Issues which are not seen. Among the issues that will increase our Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are very important actions of the heart. In fact, the actions of the heart are more important than the actions of the limbs. Pay attention to this point, guys. The actions of the heart are more important than the actions of the limbs. The actions of the heart are the generators, like, like a power generator, in which, which makes the limbs, you know, uh, work and go into action, right? It motivates the, the limbs to work and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. What I mean by the, the actions of the heart, such as love, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love is not something which is touched, right? Or seen. It is something in the heart. Also fear, khawf, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or to hope for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness and reward, which is a raja. Uh, also trust, to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone else. Uh, taqwa, truthfulness, all those are actions are within our hearts. The greater these actions of the heart are, in our heart, the stronger, the better our Iman is going to be. When we have greater love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we have greater fear, greater hope, greater trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being uh, more truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having more taqwa, dutiful, dutifulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his, you know, uh, uh, instructions, azza wa jal, here, we are better in Iman. Here we are stronger in, in Iman. Once the, uh, the ins what's inside our heart becomes stronger, this will eventually reflect upon 
our actions of our limbs. Our salah will be better. Our psalm will be better. Our sadaqah and zakah will be better. Our hajj will be better. All actions that we do, which we do it to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be perfected because of the stronger faith and iman that we have in our hearts. So let us uh, move to the uh, first uh, pillar. The first pillar is the two testimonies of faith, which is called in Arabic, ash-shahadatan. It's called in Arabic, ash-shahadatan. So the shahadatan in brief, to declare that ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah so this is called a shahada to declare that you admit that there is no god worthy of worship but allah and that and that muhammad peace be upon him is the servant and messenger of allah this statement it is the statement in which we, the person who, who was a non-Muslim gets into the fold of Islam. Of course, if he meets the prerequisite of a shahada, a shahada has prerequisites, right? To say a shahada and to, to be classified as a Muslim, there are prerequisites. What are these prerequisites, guys? Who has an answer? Well, in order for your shahada to be accepted, Abd Rahman, you have an answer? No, I, wa I want to tell another question. Go, go ahead, Abd Rahman. Is it allowed? Is it allowed to recite to uh, the same surahs in two rakahs? Yeah, it is fine. It is fine to do so. It is fine. So you guys answer my question. Now, some, someone wants to become a Muslim. He wants to say a shahada to become a Muslim, okay? What is required from him before accepting, before uttering the shahada? Uh, Abdul Rahman Bawu, please. Uh, first of all, you need to believe in the six pillars of Iman. Sant. And then secondly, you must be free from impurity. What do you mean by free from impurity? Oh, uh, like, uh, yeah, like that. Not sure that's, uh, oh, no, no, not necessarily. But when, when do you need to make wudu or wasr? Uh, if a time of a prayer comes, you need to make, uh, you need to free yourself from impurities, okay? You need to oh, make it's, uh, it's because uh, I remember from the story of Umar where he was trying to read the Surah Taha before he became Muslim. Then he was told to make wudu first. So I just remembered that. Uh, that, that's a good correlation, mashallah, Abdul Rahman. But in the case of Umar, his sister did not want to give him the, 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 the suhuf, the psalms which had some of the verses on it. He, she would not allow him to touch it, okay, until he makes wudu. Do you get the point here? Also, I mean, to touch the, the uh, Quran, even if a, if a kafir makes ablution, he still, he still, that ablution does not avail him. He needs to become a Muslim in order to uh, perform salah or, or touch the Quran or so on. Of course, the issue of touching the Quran, uh, scholars went into opinion. This, sorry to uh, go into this issue, but uh, it is it is some some scholars said you need to to make wudu before you make the touch the Quran. Some say no, it's fine to uh, touch the Quran and read from it without having ablution. Anyway, so like you said, yeah, Abdul Rahman, a prerequisite for a shahada is what? To accept the six pillars of Iman. If someone does not know the pillars of Iman and someone says to him, okay, why don't you say a shahada and become Muslim? He said, okay, ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Is he a Muslim? No. Why not? Because he didn't believe in the six pillars of Iman. Ahsanta ya Abdul Rahman. He needs to understand and then accepts the six pillars of Iman, right? He needs to learn what are the six pillars of Iman and accepts them. And then he can get into the fold of Islam. Because we have many stories where du'at may give da'wah to people, 
without presenting to them the six pillars of Iman. And then they say to them, why don't you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And that person says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And then later on, when you try to you know, scrutinize uh, his belief and you ask him, okay, what is your position uh, regarding Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him. He would say Isa is the son of God. Isa is the son of God. This statement, it cancels all the issue of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this is why we need to make sure that we, we, we convey the uh, message of Islam based on you know, priorities. Uh, and they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the six pillars of Iman are prerequisites for a person to become Muslim. Ihsan, you have something to say? Uh, but Osama raised his hand first. Can he go first? Okay, Osama, go ahead. So you have to believe in the three, in the six pillars of Iman, and plus you have to say the Shahada and believe in the Shahada. You, you can just you can't just say, say the Shahada without meaning. Asante, Osama. Why do you have an echo in your uh, in your room, uh, Osama? Are you is there a way to control the echo, or it's you're in an empty room? See if you can fix that. Ahsan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Sam Ahsan. Uh, I, I, I think most importantly, you need to have a really good niya to become a Muslim. Like, for example, if you want to say the Shahada, you have to put it in your heart that you want to become a Muslim. Ahsan, exactly. In addition to the prerequisites, of course, the niya is, is, is important. In fact, the niya, without it, uh, any act of worship that you do will not be accepted, including a shahada. So niya, it's, it's a prerequisite, it's a must in all of our uh, ibadah that we do. Good answers, mashallah. Uh, Tayyip, let us continue. So the first, the first part, the, the two testimonies comprise two testimonies, okay? The first one, it is related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one related to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the first one to testify that la ilaha illallah, testify that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, uh, the statement used, there is no deity. Deity means object of worship. Deity means object of worship. So there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone. And here I need to bring to your mind that this is the correct definition of la ilaha illallah. Some people they say la ilaha illallah means there is no God but Allah. Okay, there is no God but Allah. We need to add in this definition by saying there is no God worthy of worship. Make sure you add worthy of worship. There is no God worthy of worship but Allah. To say there is no God but Allah, this is not a complete definition. Why is it not a complete definition? Because when you say there is no God but Allah, the statement God used to mean a worship thing, right? In, real, in reality, practically speaking, if you look around us, you will see people worshiping things other than Allah, right? You will see the Christians worshiping Jesus. The Hindus worshiping so many gods. And name any other religion, you will have so many deities in which they are worshiping, right? So to say there is no God but Allah, as if you are denying that there are worship gods on earth, when in reality, there are worshiped gods beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how can we make this statement correct? We must add, there is no God worthy of worship. Yes, there are gods worshipped right now. These days, beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have things and, and matter and, and objects which are worshipped these days besides Allah, right? But are they false or true? They are false, of course. So that's why we need to mention there is no God worthy. When we say there is no God alone, uh, but Allah, as if we are saying, we don't see around us any worship gods, except Allah. 
while in reality we see false gods being worshipped, be, being taken as object of worship, like in the case of Jesus, peace be upon him, like in the case of the uh, gods of the Hindus, and so on, like the, the, the idols worshipped by the pagans and the polytheists, right, who take idols, cross, and things as an object of worship. So the correct definition, make sure you get this right, guys. The correct definition of la ilaha illallah, that either you say there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Or you may say there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah Azza wa Jalla. Is this clear, guys? Excellent. Some people, sadly, I mean, this is some of the Arabic speaking people, they say, La ilaha illallah means there is no creator but Allah. There is no creator but Allah. Is this the correct definition of la ilaha illallah? No. Why not? For real, there is no creator but Allah, right? We say to them, uh, yes, there is no creator but Allah, but this is not the definition of la ilaha illallah. Uh, Ahmed, you have something to add? Because if they say that there is no creator but Allah, then they're also saying that there are other gods. But Allah is just the creator. Ahsant. And that's not true. Ahsant Ahmed. Usama, you have something to add? I wanted to say the same thing as Ahmed. MashaAllah. Uh, did you get the point Ahmed was, was saying, guys? Yeah. He's saying that if you just say there is no creator but Allah, as if you're not denying uh, the other gods which are worshipped besides Allah, right? While the statement, la ilaha illallah, is a statement that really separates between Allah Azza wa Jal as something to be worshipped and the false deities which are taken as object of worship. So make sure the, the, the issue of ilah in Arabic, it's taken from al-ibadah, al-ma'loo, al-ma'bood, meaning the, Allah, the worship uh, thing. So the word la ilaha illallah deals with ibadah, with worship, not with anything else. So ilah, it's taken from the Arabic word. Uh, if you go to the masdar the, uh, of this word, it's from alaha. Ya'lahu ilahatan aw uluhatan meaning that alaha uh, to take it as an object of worship. So the, the term itself, la ilaha illallah, it deals with worship. It means to single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in worship. That you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other deities, if they are worshipped, then they are worshipped falsely. If someone says la ilaha illallah means no creator but Allah. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to the pagans of Mecca, right? When he first called them and he said to them, why don't you say la ilaha illallah <clears throat> and Allah will accept this statement from him. And they refused to say la ilaha illallah. We all know that the pagans of Mecca had no problem with admitting that Allah is the creator, right? All the people in the time of all prophets had no problem admitting that Allah is the creator. In fact, Allah in so many places in the Quran mentions that the pagans of Mecca admit that Allah is the creator. Allah said, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَا يَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ And if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say, Allah, <clears throat> meaning that these pagans of Mecca or the followers of the prophets or around the prophets time, they had no problem with accepting that Allah is the creator. So if la ilaha illallah means no creator with Allah, based on this definition, all people are Muslim, right? Even the pagans of Mecca, because they don't deny that Allah is the creator. Where was the problem with them in and the people whom the other prophets were sent to 
their issue was in the matter of singling Allah alone in worship. They did not admit that. So this is why the definition of la ilaha illallah deals with worship and not anything else. So if someone says la ilaha illallah means no creator but Allah, we say this is a wrong definition. If someone says la ilaha illallah means there is no raza, nobody provides but Allah, we say no, this is a wrong definition of la ilaha illallah. Yes, Allah is the raza, the, the all provider alone. Allah is the creator alone. But this is not the definition of la ilaha illallah. This is why you may see some deviated groups who worship others besides Allah. They say, based on their definition of la ilaha illallah, no creator but Allah, they say we did not violate this statement as shahada. We, ask, we still believe Allah is the creator. We say to them, you, this is a wrong definition of la ilaha illallah. The definition of la ilaha deals with worship and you are violating the definition of la ilaha illallah in this regard by worshiping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want you to understand this issue clearly, guys. This is your, this is the, the, the core of your aqidah in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the core message of all prophets. All prophets came to people who had problem with singling Allah in worship. Their people had no problem with admitting Allah is the creator. They did not claim that there are more than one creator. It was never reported that the people of the prophets before Muhammad, peace be upon him, including the people of Prophet Muhammad time, had problem with Allah the creator. They all admit there is one creator. Their main problem was to single Allah out in worship. That's why when he said to them, say, La ilaha illallah, what did they say? And Allah said about them, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَا شَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ They said, did he make the deities as one worship deity? Certainly this is a strange matter. So their issue of opposition was not allowing them to have mediators, not allowing them to have idols, in which they direct their worship to them. This is their main problem with the prophets of their time. This is their main problem, especially the pagan, pagans of Mecca with Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. When he came and told them, abandon worshiping all these idols and single Allah out subhanahu wa ta'ala in your worship, they refused to do so. They said, because they said, these idols are mediators between us and Allah. And this is something which is very dangerous. So again, guys, uh, what is the definition of la ilaha illallah? Who can restate for me the, state, the, the definition of la ilaha illallah? Abdurrahman Arif, please. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Ahsan. Hamza? There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone. Good. If we say there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, is this fine? Yes, it is fine. You can say yes. deity or God, it is fine. But we must mention worthy of worship. Yes. Uh, Siraj, please go ahead. Uh, Siraj, can you hear me, Siraj? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear uh, you. Had a, you raised your hand. You had something to say or just tell me the definition again. What is the meaning of la ilaha illallah? There is no God word worthy of worship except Allah. Uh, anyone else? You have any question regarding what, was, what I was saying here? Because this issue is very, very critical. Very, very important that you understand the definition of la ilaha illallah. If you understand this, you'll be able to tell why did many people go astray, especially those who are taking people in the grave as object of worship. They go to the wali. They say, this is the wali, this is the, wali. This is the uh, righteous man in the grave. He was so righteous. Therefore, we can take him as a mediator between us in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. We can ask him 
to provide for us, or we can ask him to ask Allah for subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. Is this a correct practice? No, because you're now you are taking others as God's object of worship. When I say taking others as God's, not creators, but object of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very dangerous matter. Right. So uh, Allah acts of worship are to be directed sincerely to Allah alone without associating any partners with him and to negate and deny all the false deities worship besides Allah. So when we say la ilaha illallah, we are negating all the false deities, right? We must negate all the false deities and then admit that Allah is to be worshipped alone. It's not enough to say that Allah is to be worshipped. This is not enough. You must negate and deny the practice of worshipping others besides Allah. If someone says, okay, I know Allah must be worshipped. It is fine to worship other, others besides him. Is this a correct statement? Let me reiterate my question. If someone says, I am worshiping Allah. It's, uh, I worship Allah. But it is fine to worship others besides him. Is this fine? No. Why not? So can you repeat it? I mean, if, so, if someone says, I worship Allah and I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is fine to worship others besides Allah. It is fine to worship Jesus or Buddha? No, sir. Why not? Because we should not just, uh, we, we should just wor worship one God and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good. Santya Siraj. Abdurrahman. Uh, Abdurrahman Baulu. Uh, it is not fine to worship others except Allah since he commanded that we should only worship him and it destroys the purpose of monotheism. Hassan. Ihsan, you have something to add? Uh, if you're worshipping someone other than Allah, you're basically associating Allah with someone else, and so you're basically committing shirk. Ihsan, again, you're committing shirk and you're violating the definition of la ilaha illallah, right? Yeah. Yeah, you are, you're simply violating the definition of la ilaha illallah. And this is the, the statement in which you get into the fall of Islam. So if you violate this statement, then the one had left the fall of Islam. Uh, Ahmed, go ahead. If you worship somebody else other than Allah, it's like you are putting, it's like you are making somebody else like the rank of Allah. Ahsan, Ahsan Ahmed. Exactly. I mean, when you take someone else as an object of worship, you are making him equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا And Allah decreed that you worship none but him. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Prophet, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَا يَحْبَطَ النَّعْمَلُ And it was revealed to you, O Muhammad, and to those who are before you, if you associate partners with Allah in worship, Allah shall make your deeds go to no avail, to not avail the Yom Al-Qiyamah. So imagine, this is said to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that if you associate partners with Allah, then your deeds will not avail you. You will leave the fold of Islam. Again, when we, you know, try to establish these uh, foundations, that does not give us, as, as lay people, as students of knowledge, the... Uh, and the uh, guts to go and call people kuffar. Be careful. The issue of classifying a practice as, as shirk, as evil, is something. And to go and name people who are practicing this as mushrikeen or kuffar, this is another issue. It's not for you to say this. This is for the ulama and the advanced students of knowledge to classify the people or the classify the practice of the people because they need to sit with each individual and give him the truth and explain to him what are the conditions of becoming a Muslim, what are the uh, 
barriers that hold you from becoming a Muslim, if he insists after that in practicing the shirk and worshiping others besides Allah, then that alim, that scholar will say this is person who is not a Muslim. Be careful, don't pray behind him and don't uh, trust him in the issue of belief because he is not a Muslim anymore. This is not for us to decide or to put titles on people. We just need to understand the practices and classify the practice. Is it right? Is it wrong? And to call people or to give them titles, this is for the ulama and the scholars. This is a very important issue I want you to be very careful of. Because these days, when we see deviated groups such as ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and, and, the, and their likes, who went to an extreme and started fighting even the Muslims. Why? Because they have classified many of the Muslims as kuffar. And they went on to extreme and started fighting the Muslims. Because to them, they are kuffar. And this is how the shaitan you know, played with their mind. They used the Quran, they used the Sunnah to try to justify their position. While in practice, the Quran and Sunnah are against them. The understanding of our righteous predecessors does not avail them in any way whatsoever. Today's topic uh, is it's, it's very important. That's why we may spend more time you know, discussing it. Let us uh, finish the, the following uh, paragraphs. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and fairly we have sent among every nation a messenger proclaiming worship Allah alone Avoid Tawut, false deities. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ And we have sent in every nation a messenger proclaiming to people worship Allah alone and avoid all the false deities. This is the core message and concern of all prophets to call people back to worship Allah alone and not to associate any partners with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Allah said also, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I, Allah created not the jinn and men, except they should worship me alone. This is the core message of Islam. Allah created man and jinn only to worship him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to associate any partners with him none whatsoever. Is it fine? Because we love the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so much. And he is so dear to us. In fact, we only learn Islam through him, right? Is it fine to take him as a mediator in worship between us and Allah Azza wa Jal? Usama? No. No. Why not? Why not, guys? Because he is not the Allah. He is sent exactly. by Allah. Excellent. In fact, he, sallallahu alayhi wa his core message is not to worship any of Allah's creation. This is the core message of Muhammad, peace be upon him. To worship Allah alone. To go and to worship Muhammad, peace be upon him, you are violating his message. You are violating his way. And you are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by associating partners with him. The worst of all sins, the worst of all sins, guys, is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone dies without repenting from this sin, he dies as a non-Muslim. Meaning that at the end, at, in, in the hereafter, he will dwell eternally in hellfire. If he dies, as a person who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. So be careful of this matter. This is the most important issue in Aqeedah that you need to understand very well. Make sure you learn it. How do you learn it, understand it? You go look around you and see how people are dealing with this matter. You go back to the Quran and Sunnah and compare their practice to what is stated in the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon Is it complying with it or is it violating it? Especially in the issue of ibadah, worship, okay? Because 
in many of the Muslim countries, unfortunately, it started to get uh, into their communities the issue of worshiping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sadly, in so many villages, you may see some, some domes built upon the graves of claimed to be righteous men. And they are taking these righteous men as mediators between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we say that it's not fine to take Muhammad, peace be upon him, the most loved person to Allah Azza wa Jal, as a mediator. How about to take someone who is less, way less in level than Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mediator between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, very, very dangerous. That's why you may see some people like sacrificing animals to the dead people, right? And we said to sacrifice as an act of worship only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot sacrifice to a false God or an object of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever you meet behind this wall testifying la ilaha illallah with certainty from his heart, give him glad tidings of paradise. Uh, he said to him, مَنْ لَقِيْتَ خَلْفَ هَذَا الْحَائِقْ يَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِيَقِينَ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ Whomever you find, so he was telling Abu Huraira a very important message that you must say la ilaha illallah, believe in la ilaha illallah with certainty. You must be certain about that. This is the intention also that Ihsan was talking about. You must be certain in your heart that Allah is one and he is to be worshipped alone without any partners. Whomever does that, he shall enter paradise. Of course, if he meets the other, requirements for la ilaha which is to do the good and to avoid the evil, to practice what Allah told you and to avoid what Allah had warned you from doing. طيب, let us quickly go over what is, when we say la ilaha illallah means worship, right? The, 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 the content, the issue, the subject of la ilaha illallah is worship, that we worship none but Allah alone. And if there are anything worshipped beside Allah, they are worshipped falsely, right? So what exactly we mean by worship? In Islam, the concept of worship is very comprehensive. It's not limited to getting into the masjid and performing prayer. No. It deals with every issue in our life, in everything that we do. Uh, if we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes an act of worship. We get reward for it. If we abstain from doing evil or some sort of sins, then it is becomes a rewardable act, an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the definition of ibadah? Worship, it is a comprehensive term for everything which, is, which Allah Azza wa Jal loves and is pleased with. Anything which Allah loves and Allah is pleased with, it is classified as ibadah. So if you do it, you get reward from Allah subhanahu Abdul Rahman, you had a question. Abdul Rahman Arif? Yes. What is ISIS? What is? ISIS. You said uh, ISIS. ISIS right now is a group available in Iraq, Syria, and some of the Muslim countries. They claim that they want to establish an Islamic state, right? But their approach is wrong. They went on and classified many Muslims as kuffar, and they started fighting and killing the Muslims. In fact, they did more killing in the Muslims, more damage to the Muslim communities than they did to the kuffar. So their way is a great deviance. They are using, you know, uh, guns and, and, and weapons uh, to, to uh, kill the Muslims before the non-Muslims under the uh, guys that they are uh, fighting, those who, who had come outside the boundary of Islam, outside the fault of Islam. So it is a deviated group who are shedding the blood of the Muslims 
uh, under the pretext that they are trying to establish Islamic State uh, while using a wrong way, a deviated way. So be aware of them. So again, worship means everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. It is classified as an act of worship, ibadah. That act of worship, it can be whether it is a statement or an action, statement or an action, whether it was inwardly or outwardly. Remember, we talked about Iman and Islam. We have inwardly deeds and outwardly deeds. So the ibadah, it can be inwardly, like the actions of the heart, love, fear, hope, trust, repentance, uh, taqwa, uh, and all that, okay? Uh, all these are actions of the heart. These actions of the heart, if we focus on them and take good care of them, we are doing ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are increasing our love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by understanding Allah's attributes and reading about Allah's attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala to venerate him, azza wa jal, glorify him, the exalted he is, right? This will increase our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our hope for the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reward of Allah azza wa jal. So these are now inwardly actions, which are all love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it is ibadah. It is worship also. We have outwardly uh, actions which are love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is pleased with. Like, like what guys? Give me some examples. Things that you may do with your lips and your tongue, which are love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is pleased with them if we do them. Reading the Quran. Ahsan, reading Quran. Ahmed. Praying Salah. Praying Salah, excellent. You can speak, guys, without me giving you permission. No problem. Go ahead. If you have something to, uh, to state, say it. Helping your parents. Helping the parents, good, being dutiful to the parents. What Just say, saying nice things to people. Ahsan, ahsan, saying good things, being kind and nice and speaking good to people. This is outwardly actions, right? These actions, salah, zakah, hajj, siyam, being dutiful to the parents, being, be, being kind even to the animal, right? Being kind to your neighbor, being kind even to the non-Muslims. These are actions which are love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and they are and uh, reading Quran. Ahsanta, Ya Hamza, reading Quran is also among the, the, the statements of the tongue, right? Give me some examples for the statements of the tongue, for example, guys. Making dua. Ahsant, making dua, good. Usama, what else? Speaking kindly to others. Speaking kindly to others, good. Using your tongue. What else? Speaking the truth. Sorry? Speaking the truth. Good. Telling the truth. Ahsan. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting the Quran. All that are done with the tongue, right? And these are actions of, uh, among the actions of the outward the actions. Uh, uh, Ahmed, please go ahead. Stopping evil from happening. Stop. Stopping doing evil, right? Is that what you mean? Yes. yes to, to, to abstain and refrain from doing evil. This is love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to hold your limbs from doing evil, to do good with your limbs, this is a ibadah which you are rewarded for. So the issue of ibadah in Islam, it is comprehensive. It covers every matter in our life. You do the good, abstain from the, the evil, you are in a state of ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are rewarded for it. Even among the, the, the hadith, like in, in, in uh, Bukhari, uh, uh, where a man uh, saw a branch of thorns in the street, he just removed it up of the way of the people, right? So that they will not get harmed by it. Allah rewarded him. The man who went into the well and uh, drank water and fed a poor thirsty dog, right? Although dog is an inanimate animal, right? Living thing. He gave him 
water to drink, Allah rewarded him for that act. So if you move anything on the way of people, you saw broken glasses, you saw nail, and you have removed it from the way of people, Allah rewards you for that act. It becomes an act of worship rewardable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the issue of collecting reward, especially with intention, you do it, I intend to do that act to get the reward for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to help people and to save people from harm. Such practice, Allah reward you for it subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here are some of the examples I stated here for the outwardly and inwardly actions, such as praying, giving charity, fasting, pilgrimage, uh, dutifulness to the parents, good manners, reading the Quran, remembering Allah, uh, and love, hope, fear, trust. All these are examples for uh, ibadat, worship, acts of worship. So one should maintain sincerity for Allah in all types of ibadah. You cannot say, I'm going to give sadaqah uh, for the sake of Allah and for the sake of a dead person in the grave, right? Or an object of worship, a deity, a false deity. Uh, or you cannot say, I fear Allah like I fear this dead person in the grave. No, here you are associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It must be sincerely for Allah alone. I fear Allah alone subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? I love Allah alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what about we have love for the parents? We have love for the wife and the husband and the children. Is this a permissible love? Yes. Yes, it is permissible love. In fact, it is recommended and you are rewarded for it. To love your wife, to love your children, to love your, your fellow friends and Muslims. It is recommended and love. But what we mean by love, which becomes shirk, is the love which is object of worship other false gods, to love the uh, gods of the, uh, the, the idols, for instance, or to love a dead person who was taken as an object of worship, or to fear him, for instance. Here it becomes uh, an, an, an act which violates sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hamza, go ahead, please. I'm so amazed that uh, we get reward uh, on every small things also. Okay. This is how generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah wants us to meet him collecting as much reward as we can. For every tiny act of, of, of kindness that you do to anyone around you, Allah reward you generously subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why when you look into this life and the purpose of this life and why we exist here and why are we here, we need to exploit every second and every moment to collect as much reward as we can. Why is that? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to comply with his guidance and to win the companionship of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the highest rank of Jannah, Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. So this is a life of, you know, uh, competing in goodness and doing our best to do as much acts of kindness, acts of worship that we can in order to collect as much reward so that we win the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's pleased with us and to win the, com the companionship of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I guess I'll, I'll stop here, guys, and we'll continue the remaining part of the test, first testimony of the first pillar of Islam, which is testimony uh, in coming class. So far, guys, everything is uh, crystal, crystal clear, inshallah ta'ala. Good, no doubts, no questions. Excellent. But if no questions, nothing more to add, guys, I'll leave you off here, inshallah. Uh, Hamza, you have something to add or say? Yeah, I made my notes here. I sent it. You, you, made, you did what? I made my notes. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Barakallah ya Hamza. Thank you for doing that. This is very important, guys, that you keep taking notes because this information will remain with you as a reference, right? 
Two weeks later, all of what was said here will be forgotten. What is the way to go back to this information? Is whatever you have written down, it will avail you in order to, you know, continue uh, reviewing whatever you learn and study, inshallah. You also did that, yeah, Abdurrahman, mashallah. Excellent. Guys, please try to write down notes, please, and try to go back to the book and read the part, the section that we have covered in every session. Ahmed, you have something to add? I send it to oh, the chat. I don't uh, write down my notes, I just type them. MashaAllah. Maybe you can share them in the Telegram group also, Ahmed. In our Telegram group uh, channel, you, you can share them there for, for others to keep notes. Of course, if Ahmed shares with us his notes, that does not mean that you guys do not take notes. No, everyone takes his notes, but uh, it is kind of you guys if you share your notes with others. I think it through the chat. Good, Ahsante, Hamza. Can you just uh, tell me once again your uh, email address? I will send you to uh, Gmail. Let me let me I'll write you down my my. Let me just stop sharing the screen. This is my email address. Shots right. So I've sent you my email, guys. Okay, thanks. Sure you copy it. وإياكم بارك الله فيكم أحسن الله إليكم May Allah reward you all abundantly for staying persevering attending these classes and when we see many of the youngsters are so much you know, fascinated with the you know temptations of this life wasting their times and not exploiting moments to gain more knowledge and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are upon a path which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, attending such sessions is an act of worship. You are rewarded for every moment that you are sparing in this regard. So be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding you to this. Okay, guys, barakallahu fikum wa jazakumullahu khaira wa sallallahu ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum wa